Welcome back to Division One Rejects. I'm your host, Kobe Manso. This is episode 166. Put out a tweet the other day. I said, people are saying this could be one of the best episodes in D1R history. The people. Guilty. I'm excited about this one. I'm really pumped about this one. This is June 17th, the night of. I'm recording this one. I've got some top-tier talent, top-tier guests for you tonight. Uh, the first of which, the head coach at... Uh, Northeastern State University. How about Coach Darren Chivarini? He was uh, played wide receiver at Colorado, ended up playing in the NFL for a few years, bounced around a couple different teams there, was the OC back for the Buffs, coached at Texas Tech, and uh, has made his head coaching debut with uh, Northeastern State. Has a lot of great uh, things to say about that program, what he's building down there, and what they call the Qua. Excited to talk to him. It's a guest been working on for a while. In other news... Coach Straz, who uh, from Concordia University, Ann Arbor, those of you who have been listening for the pod for a while, remember Coach Straz from about 136 episodes ago? Yeah, that was in 2021. That's crazy. He's back for round two, albeit under not so great of circumstances. Concordia, Ann Arbor, their school announced that all their athletics programs are being cut after 2024. That is just shitty news. The school staying open, athletics done, football, and all the other sports let known way in advance. So they have this, like, end game, last dance kind of deal going on down there in Ann Arbor. We talked to him all about that. And then finally, Jimmy Martin will join us. But joining Jimmy Martin to talk D3 football today, a man who won a national championship last year, played wide receiver for the Cortland Red Dragons, now with the Cincinnati Bengals. How about Cole Burgess joining the show once again? He, uh, he Jimmy, and myself all break down the Lindy's Sports Mag preseason rankings for Division Three football. Excited, excited, excited about all three of these conversations. Listen to all of them or listen to one of them. I don't care what you, hear, what you came here for. Just listen, right? Tune in. I'm, I'm glad you guys are here. There are timestamps, video chapters, bottom of the screen. Fast forward to any part of the episode you find remotely intriguing or interesting. But uh, other topics for tonight, talked about the preseason rankings for D3 football, CUAA, their last dance, so to speak, in 2024, the fall season. How about the NAIA player of the year potentially going to the Big Ten? That feels like a nugget of news worth sharing. We've talked about Jill Cramstead on this program uh, a decent amount. There's news that he was potentially in a Big Ten camp. Not potentially. He was there, damn it. Uh, he was there showing off his talents at a Big Ten camp. We'll talk about that later on. That's a big piece of news. And then also, to follow that one up, just a, another great piece of news. How about the youngest offensive coordinator in college football currently? He's 23 years old. That's crazy. We're going to talk about it towards the end of the episode. Stick around for that one. Excited for that part of the conversation. But as always, you can watch us on YouTube. Don't forget about those timestamps. I mentioned them. You can listen pretty much anywhere else. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you name it. Follow us on the socials. A lot of great stuff going on for D1 Rejects right now. But uh, with that being said, I don't even want to clog up any more of the episode. My blabbing. Let's get right into that first guest conversation. Join the show tonight. Head ball coach down at Northeastern State. The man's got quite the playing and coaching resume at the college and NFL level. Now, though, he's building something special in what they call the quad down in Oklahoma. Coach Darren Giverini. What's going on, coach? How are you, man? What's up? What's up, Kobe? Appreciate you having me on the show, man. Looking Pumped forward to get you to on it. here, man. Yeah, it's awesome, man. I, I'm, I know you've been hitting me up, man. And I, believe me, I haven't been ignoring you. I just... I got I get so many requests. And then, two, it's just trying to build this program, man. It's been a lot of work and... Uh, I don't get much free time, so I'm, I'm glad I got to come on the show tonight, man. You and me both. And I know um, for as someone who works in the college athletics, that landscape, I know like up in the Superior Dome up here, that office is empty right now. Those guys are all out on the road and doing different things. The only time they might come back is for um, their camps and their other things they have going on on campus. So um, for the people who wonder – what these coaches do in the quote unquote off season. Uh, you, you know, all too well from your various stops uh, playing and coaching, what that entails. But uh, I'd ask you what you've been up to this summer with the guys, but man, I've been seeing it all over social media, which is, which is great. And you and I talked about that briefly before we got going on and, th and that constant presence of getting stuff out there, but you've got a huge portion of that squad there in the summer and that you talked about the like seven week program. I listened to you talk about it a little bit. Talk about that buy-in and how you're able to get that from your guys, because it seems like they, like I said, there's a large number of guys there. That is not easy to do at this level of football. How are you able to make that happen? You know, I think it's just all how you present it and how you frame the summer workouts for them. I mean, I try to talk to them about this is a chance for you guys to get in shape for fall camp and not only get in football shape, but also, you know, we're doing football school. And so they're learning concepts on offense and defense and special okay. teams that and really being able to apply it to their conditioning. And so we try to work some football movements into their 
football knowledge. So it kind of transitions from the practice, from the meeting room to the practice area. And so it's been good. We have a great group on campus. You know, I just got here in January and we've been building this roster ever since. And um, we've signed close to, I think, 57 players now. Man, and we were we retained. Awesome. We were. Yeah, it's crazy. We retained about 24 from last year's team. Okay. And so, uh, you know, it's going to be a. Uh, it's going to be a lot of work, but that's why we do this. And, um, you know, I've, I've been very pleased of just so far to guys, how hard they've been working and the kind of program that we're building with our staff and our players. So it's uh, it's fun, man. It's fun when you get a chance to bring players in that want to learn and want to compete. And that's kind of where we're at right now. And it's a lot of guys, too. Like you said, you know, you have that uh, small nucleus of guys who are coming back from the previous team. These are all guys who are here for the first time, for the most part. A lot of guys who are coming in to a new spot. So having them all in the same uh, building, if you will, the same vicinity is is huge for you guys. Um, And I think the big reason why that's not so easy at this level of football is because of all the other things that come with coordinating that, right? Uh, The things like finding guys jobs in the summer, trying to find them housing for guys who aren't typically there uh, during those months. Uh, the meals, all those things that, you know, you have varying levels of uh, involvement with, but there's so many pieces that go into that. How tough was it uh, for you and your guys that obviously at this level of football already stretched pretty thin? You wear a lot of hats at that position. How tough was it to, to take that on and make this happen in a short turnaround? Because like you said, you get there in January, you've only got a few months before these guys are typically heading home and are, you know, a lot of them are usually probably home for the summer. You might not see them till August. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the first summer bridge program they've done in the history of the school. And so, um, you know, having a lot of meetings with our president of our school, having a lot of meetings with our athletic director of our school and coming up with a plan that makes sense, you know, budget wise. And also, you know, from a scheduling standpoint with food and feeding our players and the cafeteria and having housing for them on campus. Huge. You know, it's been a it's been a lot of work, but, you know, the one thing that. I told the athletic director, I said, if, if you hire me, then we're going to do things at a very high level because all I've been associated with is either division one level as a power five assistant for 10 years or, you know, working my way up in the junior college ranks when I was a young coach, but playing for some and coaching for some really good football coaches that did things at a high level. So, you know, we're trying to elevate, you know, Northeastern state back to what it was back in the early nineties and late eighties. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I tell our players, I mean, the past is not a predictor of the future. The only thing that's a predictor of the future is the present. And so what we're doing right now, how we train, how we feel our bodies, how we learn is going to dictate what we do on Saturdays in the fall. And so that's what we've been doing so far and during the summer bridge program. It's been a it's been a good group to be around. And I'm excited about what we do here coming up uh, in August and September. Absolutely, man. You wear a lot of hats as the head coach and as the the dude who leads that program. Is one of those hats grill master for the uh, end of summer barbecue, or maybe not? Haven't put that one on yet. So I, what was good is I, I got a. We actually had a big barbecue for the guys coming in on Sunday. And, okay. Uh, our defensive coordinator, Coach Tonavasa, was on the grill, man, for about three hours working that grill. So. <laughs> We had a great event. We had about 75 players at the house. And uh, you see it on my social media. And those guys were in the pool. They were playing yep. Madden. They were playing 2K. I mean, just a great way to kind of build camaraderie off the field. I mean, the thing about football, as we all know, it gets very intense. And there's a lot of adversity that hits during the season and during practice. But you got to be able to build the trust off the field. And so I think – For us to get these players together with our staff in a non-pressure environment, non-practice environment, is just a great way to build team camaraderie. Hell yeah. And, you know, building team camaraderie, you got 70-whatever grown men over there. How many, uh, I don't know what the food of choice was, your burgers, brats, whatever, ribs, whatever you got going on. What is the grocery bill uh, for uh, for an event like that, just out of curiosity? Shoot, we had to fun- we had to fundraise that money, and it was shoot, it was probably about close to a thousand dollars for oh, that. Shit, those That's were all, awesome. Those were all those were all fun. Hold on, let my dog. In. Those are all fundraisers. You're money. good. You're good. That is ridiculous. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I'm telling you, man. It was my wife was cooking, and you know, our coaches were cooking, and it was a really good event, man. I really, you know, you you get to see a different side of kids when it's just outside of football, and so I'm, I'm big on doing that. We're gonna. We're going to float down uh, the Illinois River here in a couple weeks okay. and uh, want to get all of our kids out there, get a chance to kind of do some team bonding and, and uh, 
I think that's important to building, you know, your team culture. And so we, we, we speak about our culture daily. And, and, you know, if you ask every coach, they're going to give you a different definition, definition on culture. But for us, we keep it real simple. It's just about our thoughts, our words, and our actions. Those three things make up our culture, how we think, how we communicate with each other, and, and how we act, you know, on and off the field. So we keep it real simple on our team culture. And I think we're building a good team culture right now in Tahlequah. I like that. I like that a lot. And, you know, all the great programs do it, right? I think, you know, we had a, just most recently had a defensive lineman on, on from Harding who, you know, about their success and, and the brotherhood, mm-hmm. literally what they call it up there and uh, different set of circumstances, but they get those alumni and that support system involved to have them able to go do those things like bringing a hundred kids out for a camping weekend or do whatever. And so the fact that, you know, you come into a program and you have to fundraise for so much else. And, and like you had talked about earlier, do so many other things and overcome these challenges. The fact you're still able to do this with these guys is is very important and sticking right on that on that thought right those challenges overcoming and doing a lot of that right now the obvious things funding recruiting overcoming a history of at least recently of not a lot of success you talk about uh you know 80s and 90s and kind of restoring that pride to this program what are the conversations like when you get brought on into a program like this one about the goals and standards that you're going to bring to this team, but then also I think more importantly, the timelines in a day and age where college football has has changed a lot. What were those conversations like with the administration uh, down at NSU about the timelines that you're going to put here about when they can expect, because like everyone knows this is a uh, product and success based business. What were those conversations like? You know, I think, Whenever you, you know, you have success or failure, you, you know, you, you have to look at not just, you know, the immediate roster or the staff. It's look, you have to look at infrastructure and how things align at the top. The one thing I can tell you about Northeastern State and what I was very pleased with when I came on my interview and then also when I was hired is that we have alignment at the top of this university from the president's office all the way down to the athletic director's office. And that was something that I needed to see before I came to Oklahoma and to Tahlequah, you know, Dr. Hanley is our president at, here at Northeastern State. And the, the first thing he told me, he's like, Darren, he's like, you know, if we hire you as our head football coach, you know, if there's ever an issue, you come to my office. You know, I've never had a president tell me that. And then he also told me, you know, that, you know, athletics is the front porch of our institution. And we want to make sure that our football program is back in the win column. And, and Northeastern State hasn't been very good. I mean, there's no way to sugarcoat it that they yep. have been one of the worst programs in the MIAA over the last 10 years. But again, again, it goes back to, you know, the past isn't a predictor of the future. You know, what, what you're doing daily on building your culture, building your staff, building your roster and how you're being proactive and not talking about the problems, but talk about the solutions and how we can fix it. And yeah. that's what we've been doing. We've been, we've been very creative on how we're fundraising you know, we've gotten some alumni support from which they didn't have as much, you know, the last couple of years. And there's some heavy hitters in our alumni base that are big OU donors, too, that are giving back to our program now, which they haven't done for a little bit. So, you know, going back to your question, I think you got to have alignment at the top. It's got to come down through the athletic director's office. You know, they want to win here at Northeastern State. And I told them if they hire me, then I'm going to do things a certain way at a high level to get us to the point where we need to get to to win football games in the fall, but also build a program that's sustainable long term, not just short term. So that's what we're really doing right now this summer. Yeah, hundred percent. It feels like you know, staying on that thought, that timeline has changed at least to me. Someone who hasn't been covering uh, football for a decade or two, right? But for me, that timeline has changed even in the time span that I have covered. In that, you know, maybe a decade ago, you bring in a head coach, especially at this level, and you have these four or five years to bring in and fully develop your own recruiting class and get the guys that you want in to kind of mold and, and shape into that program. Now, does very much does not seem like the case with a lot of these jobs. The timeline has been shortened by a good margin and you see a lot of coaches especially with the introduction of obviously transfer portal and other means of trying to find that instant production has in your opinion maybe a little bit of a tougher one but has in your opinion the head coaching role in college football has that become a less desirable role in the last decade I think I think being you know I think being a head coach at the college level especially the power four power five level whatever whatever you want to call it nowadays is probably one of the harder jobs in America not just not just football. It's one of the hardest jobs in America because now you're managing, you know, if you're an NFL head coach, you know, you're, you're managing basically your roster. You know, mm-hmm. you're not worried about NIL. You're not worried about, you're not doing the contract negotiations. You're not 
really worrying about the recruiting department and all that kind of stuff. But if you're a power four head coach, you know, you have to really look at not only balancing your budget NIL wise, because really, let's be real. I mean, the collectives are going to want to talk to the head coach to see what they want to pay these guys yep. and where it's going to fall into the budget of what we have, you know, raised through the collectives. Then they're also then you also got it as a head coach, you're going to have to manage your recruiting staff because now you have recruiting departments at the college level that are overseeing basically your assistant coaches and telling them who they want you to recruit, where you want you to go. So you got to manage that staff, manage your own staff, which is, you know, you're managing 10 assistant coaches at the power four level. And then you got to manage your roster, which is now you're talking about a hundred and something kids. And so I think being a division one power four head coach is probably one of the more challenging jobs right now. And, you know, you look at even being a division two head coach where I'm sitting right now, it's very similar. It's not that scale. We don't have those resources, but yeah. I'm managing I'm managing NIL right now. I'm managing our roster. I'm managing the recruiting. I'm help doing the social media. I'm help directing all this kind of stuff. I'm wearing a million hats. And so, you know, I look at it, it's preparing me for doing this job at a very high level. And so you can't complain about it. You know, you got to just accept it and look at the, what are the solutions to the problems and not harp on the problems because there's a million problems at this level and the division one level. I was at that level for a long time and worked closely with a lot of head coaches. So I saw the challenges that they were faced with daily. But I think right now in college football, we still got to get back to, you know, what I talk about our four pillars at NSU and that's, you, we got to recruit, obviously NIL is a part of recruitment now, yep. but we got to retain, there's gotta be more retention at, every level of football when you got 5,000 players in the transfer portal majority of those guys will not get out of the portal I mean that's the stats show it I think less than 20 percent or 25 percent are getting out of it right now so as as coaches and as the as the adults in the room we need to start doing a better job of retaining our student athletes and develop developing them not only on the football field which is important to our job security but also in the classroom and making sure these kids are graduating. And the problem right now in college football is that we've really got into a free market without rules, with collectives. We don't have collective bargain agreements. You know, we don't have salary caps in place. And it's really, I think, I think we're going to look back on this time in college football and it's going to be like, wow, it's amazing that we were able to function for those five to seven years. Absolutely. I think, no, absolutely. I think they, I think things are changing going forward. I really do. And they need to change for the better. I'm not saying we're not going to ever close Pandora's box. That's been open. And, and, and the players should get some of the revenue. But yep. I think when you start talking about revenue sharing, you start talking about NIL, okay, well, then now it becomes you almost have to break away from the NCAA at that That's, level. Oh, yeah. And, and, and you have to come down to being employees, and you're going to be treated like employees. So if you don't play well, you're going to get cut. And that's where this thing is headed right now because it's getting away from the student athlete model. And now it's into the employee model about you have to perform at a certain level to maintain this contract. Yeah. Or if you don't, then, and I don't know if that's what we want, but that's where it's at right now. Then you're gone. It, yeah. It's at, we're at the tipping point where it's either going to go all the way over because now we're talking about revenue sharing, we're talking about contracts, we're talking about NIL collectives. I'm telling you, when it gets to this point, now it gets it's away from the, any kind of NCA amateurism model, and it's about basically pay for play, and it's about performance. And it's so, a slippery slope. It's, it's a very, very slippery sl slope. Very yeah. slippery. It's very slippery. It almost becomes like college football or, or the Power Four conferences will break away, and they'll yep. be their own model with their own commissioner and their own salary caps. But it's almost going to break away from the school too because. The academics and the athletics now, to me, in college football are not lining up. Yeah. And so I think that's what I love right now about where I'm at in my career is that I'm able to develop these student athletes on the field, but also in the classroom, understanding that I tell our guys, listen, if you leave NSU, if you transfer from NSU, it means you're a really good player and you're going up. You're going to OU, you're going to Oklahoma State, you're going to Tulsa, you're going to Texas Tech, you're going to Colorado. You don't make lateral moves at this level, okay? You need to understand that you're a student and you're an athlete, and they go hand in hand. And we're building you not only as football players, but we want to build you for success after football ends. And I think right now we've gotten away from that around college athletics, 
it really has gotten away from retention and development. And right now it's just about what can you give me and can we win and I can get the next job. And I don't think that's yeah. what it should be about. You know, it shouldn't I, be about I hear you. That. And I've heard you speak multiple times about it too. And that, you know, you're sitting down, we go back to that transfer portal number, right? And we had just posted something about that at, at this late of a stage in the game to have 5,000 names in, in that portal is ridiculous. And you've talked about it before of you sit down with these parents and these families in their living room. And you talk about the promises that you make and, and of trying to get their, uh, their sons through school. And a lot of those guys, not only, you know, and I know are not going to be playing football in the fall. They won't be finishing their education. And that's a huge, no, portion. they won't. Even a more important right portion of, of all this that gets lost, um, and, and you talk about all the things that make this job still appealing for you, and I think that's what's really important. And you mentioned it multiple times, and, and not focusing on the problems and focusing on how we can how we can work around them. And, and in today's day and age, what you can what you can do with that cert, those circumstances. But you played at Colorado, solid career in the NFL. You've been, I mean, just all across the board. I'm not going to waste my time search, going through your whole coaching through uh, coaching tree. A lot of people um, can find that on their own, but you've made some great connections along the way. Talk to me about that network, how you've leveraged that now in your current position at NSU to get this place uh, up and rolling now. You know, I think, you know, when you, when you work for a bunch of different head coaches and, you know, you see what you like and what you don't like, I think when you have experience through different wearing different hats from being an assistant to being not only an offensive coordinator, but a special teams coordinator, being a recruiting coordinator, being an interim head coach, you know, when you wear a lot of different hats, it's good in the sense that you're gaining experience that's going to really help you down the road. And all those hats I wore, whether it's Colorado or Texas Tech or UCLA or even going through the, the JUCO ranks as an assistant or as a head coach, you know, there's no there's there's no substitute for experience. Yep. And so, you know, I was I was in a position where, you know, I had been a coordinator. I've been assistant for a long time. And I, I knew that I could run a program the way I felt like it should be run. And I believed in, in you know, my principles as a head coach. I believed in, you know, my ability to not only recruit, but develop and retain players. And so, you know, that's the mission that I've been on since I became a head coach two years ago was, you know, I want to do things the way I know they should be done and nothing against other coaches. And I was always a, a, a loyal assistant and I, you know, I did what the head coach wanted me to do, but there's things maybe I disagreed with, but I didn't go against ever go against the head coach. That's yeah. one thing in this profession. You have to be loyal, even though that you might not agree with the head coach. You can disagree with them, but you can't undermine him. Of and course. That's one thing that I was always proud of in, in my career that I've never undermined. I might have disagreed and I might have you know spoken up in a staff meeting. And, you know, I know sometimes in this profession, it's not, you know, the the most pleasant thing to do, but I don't want, I don't want people to be yes people that work for me. And so I tell our, our coaches all the time, listen, you can disagree with me and we can have a discussion about it. But at the end of the day, I'm the head football coach and I'm going to do what's best for our program and our players going forward. But I want our coaches to speak up in staff meetings, but once a decision is made by the head football coach, we move forward. And I think, uh, you know, I've been on staffs where that wasn't always the case. You know, if you spoke up in a staff meeting, you were kind of like, you know, wasn't the most yeah. appeasing thing to do in a staff meeting. But yeah. I believe that you got to have discussions because football is a very, very multifaceted game with a lot of different personalities. You're dealing with the high roster numbers, high staff member numbers, and you're not always going to agree on everything, but you have to all be rowing in the same direction. Yeah. And so, um, you know, going back to your point, man, I think just the experience of being – you know, like I said, a junior college assistant to being a coordinator, a head coach at that level, to being a power five assistant and coordinator wearing a lot of different hats. It, it's really helped me to get myself in this position to help build, you know, NSU back to where we needed to be and uh, keep developing myself as a head coach because I'm the head football coach, but I also run the offense. And, and I love that because I have the freedom to have my identity on it and my personality without having to answer to someone else that says yes or no. And so – there's there's a there's a there's a really freedom in that sense of being a play caller where you're the head football coach and uh, I've enjoyed you know my time here so far in Tahlequah the town is unbelievable we got great people that want to see this program win we got great players that are in our program we've signed some really dynamic players these last couple months and uh, I'm excited I'm excited to 
show people what we're about in the fall, but we're putting a lot of work in right now. We're going to put a lot of work in in fall camp when we get our pads on. Hell yeah. I appreciate it, coach. That's great, man. That's everything that I think you want to hear from a head coach, right? And it's easy to, again, easy to say it. Another thing to go do it. You're already making those steps. Uh, I'm happy to see that and uh, just have, with the presence you guys have started to build, you know, social media otherwise, kind of have that scope into your, your day-to-day and those other things. But excited to watch you guys this upcoming season, man. You got a fan over here in me. Um, once again, appreciate your time a ton. Thank you for coming on the show and chatting with me, man. Yeah, Kobe, appreciate it, man, and look forward to following your guys, your career with your podcast and and doing some great things, man. Keep keep chasing your dreams, bro, because oh, yeah. I always say this, no one else is going to chase them for you, so you got to chase them. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Coach. Have a good rest of your night, man. All right, brother. See you, Sam. See ya. On to potentially the most fun part of the episode, and that's talking Division Three football preseason rankings. And uh, I'm not alone in this regard. Tonight we got not one, but uh, two gents joining me. The first of which you've seen his face on here a lot. Jimmy, what's going on? What a hat are we? What do we got on right there? Is that a Red Sox? This actually, this is the uh, – I wore this. I don't know. I have been. Uh, I wore it today to, to when I was coaching, and it's a really special hat to me. It's like I got it in yeah. Cooperstown when I was like a travel baseball tournament. Okay. So Brooklyn Dodgers – wait, no, this side. Okay, it's like not a Boston light. Red Sox. Yeah. No. Wanted it's actually to make the Brooklyn that abundantly Dodgers. clear. It is cool blue, hat. so. <laughs> it's like the Cooperstown collection, so it's and, like a pretty uh, – like, Cool the man without a hat in the middle. Uh, you saw him on here a few weeks ago. It feels like a little bit of a while ago now. But uh, Cole Burgess joins us, the man who you'll know him from Cortland, the national championship run, and uh, now on to the Bengals and, and a lot of things post-grad. Excited to have you join us tonight talk some rankings, dude. Hell yeah, I'm excited to be here. You know, I just, just got back to New York from the uh, OTA, so I was like, why not go talk some D3 football with the guys? You know what I mean? I'm excited why for not? it. No better time than the present, dude. And uh, the rankings coming out. Uh, Lindy Sports, right? They put out the preseason rankings. And Lindy Sports Mag, known for their D1 coverage, less known for the D2 coverage, maybe not so much, if at all, known for the D3 coverage. So take all of these rankings with a grain of salt. I wish people could understand that when we post these out there. One, that we aren't, these aren't our rankings, right? And two, that... Lindy Sports Mag is not exactly the best coverage of Division Three football. Nonetheless... They do put some kind of, you know, method of, to their madness, some kind of algorithm that throws these together. So let's take a look at these rankings. And I think starting off, I think the first thing that is abundantly part of the conversation right now, defending national champs at third. I, I feel like that feels, in your perspective, got to be blatant disrespect. Tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, definitely. And this that's one thing I've never understood is, like, when a team wins it all and then they aren't number one in the preseason or any poll, to be honest, until they get beat, like, I feel like you have it until you don't, or at least that should be the way it is. But I guess that's not how Lenny football looks at it. And, uh, yeah, the Dragons, they got they got their work cut out for them, and they got to just prove people wrong again. I mean, it's yeah, going to be an 100%. interesting season. And you lose your top two wide receivers, obviously, in you and in JJ, who both, both go on to find professional opportunities, which in itself is ridiculous. That is just an awesome feat uh, for any school to have, let alone a Division three school. That's ridiculous. You lose those two. But now you talk about the rest of that offensive skill. You have some people on the outside still coming back. Obviously, Zach Boy's under center. Afano St. John in the backfield. You have some big pieces coming back on that offense when it comes to the skill positions that I don't think, outside of Zach, obviously, maybe get talked about enough. I feel like there's going to be more of a rebuild for the Red Dragons that a lot of people give them credit for. Um, Yeah. One thing I'm excited to see is just the way Coach Fitz handles it because, I mean, since he's been in the program, he's always made the most of what he had, you know, on the offense. And and this is just another year for him to do it. He's got Zach coming back. He's got Jaden coming back and some other playmakers, like you said. So, I mean, he's got the defense to uh, – they don't need to score 60 points a game, I don't think. That too. I think there's going to be – there's going to be a few 21-0 wins, I think. I, I, w- I would love to see that because the defense is coming back and they're going to be they're going to be coming full throttle. So, uh, yeah, like I think the offense is just going to have to find a way to score 30 points a game, and I think th- that'll do the job. And we saw that defense put on display at least, well, definitely in the first half of that national championship game. You look at the difference in the first half and the second half, and uh, both those defenses were just playing on their heads, I guess, so to speak. But to talk on on Cortland and, and kind of their season coming up before we get back to kind of the rest of the rankings here, the Red Dragons are favored by at least two touchdowns in all of their regular season games in 2024. 
that's kind of a ridiculous stat in itself. Even when you talk about uh, week three at Susquehanna, who that's a squad we're going to look at ranked in the top 25. You talk about a team that probably just missed the cut in Ithaca, back-to-back Liberty League champions, and obviously a rivalry game uh, to have that kind of spread, courtesy of Hanson ratings, Logan Hanson we had on the show uh, pretty recently here. Even teams like Brockport, who started a really solid defense and some other squads that uh, are certainly no pushovers, but to have those kind of numbers and that kind of hype, uh, that's kind of a lot to live up to. How do, how do we feel about that? Being over two exactly. touchdown favorites in all these. Yeah, no, that is definitely a lot to live up to, especially considering the fact that we did, they lost me and JJ. And I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not trying to be like cocky and all that, but like we we really helped out the offense, made it explosive. So there's gonna be young guys that got to step up. And uh, I, to be honest, the 14 point spread for all the games, I I do agree with, except for the Ithaca game. I mean. If just look at the Cortica history, it's always a nail biter down to the end. So I think Gotta they be. do win by more than fourteen every game, except except the Cortica game. I think that'll be a close game, but not. Yeah, I, I, that's what I think is going to happen. Maybe Susquehanna, Susquehanna. Um, to be fair, it shouldn't have been as close as it was last year. We shouldn't have lost to them. If you watch the game, we were up by fourteen and then just laid an egg in the last five minutes. So yeah. I think it's doable. I think it's doable, and we'll see how Cortica shakes out. 100%. Yeah, the Cortica, the Cortica spread, like, that's just, especially when you talk about a story rivalry like that, to have, that that just feels ridiculous. Um, and obviously, he goes off his projections and models, and I don't know what kind of weight that, like, history and rivalries have in, in that context. But I guess to move on here, Jimmy, I think the next biggest thing, at least in my eyes, that stands out, um, we can talk Wyack in a little bit, too. Alma at 19, that feels chaotically low. A- am I alone in, in saying that in that regard? You are not alone. In fact, uh, there's a lot of people in the Division Three community, including Logan Hanson, who we had on the show recently, as you said. like He had Alma like top 10. He, yeah. had, him at, he had them at 10 in his ratings. So and he's like really analytical and has a lot of like data that backs his reasoning and everything. And I just, I don't know, like you said, you got to take these rankings with a grain of salt. And I think, I mean, Alma's probably seen that going like, what? Like 19? Like, come on, bro. I don't know. I, I, that was the I, thing I, that definitely stood out the most to me. I could speak on that because we did play them last year and uh, their offense was the real deal. Like we were the number one offense in the league and then it was North Central, but I think Alma was clearly the number three offense. It was a battle. Like we went back and forth for three quarters. I mean, I, I don't forget the amount we had in the first half, but I think it was like the total was 60 points or something in the first half. That offense is for real. They're bringing back a lot of star power, a lot of a lot of firepower to stretch the field. And I think, I think they're going to make a Elite Eight Final Four run again. For sure. Oh, yeah. I, I'd like to see that. And, you know, for Alma, too, you talk for me, you know, they return a lot of their offensive production, right? Guys on the outside, in the backfield, Carter St. John under center. There's a lot of really good things coming back for that Alma offense. Now, also, when you look in terms of rankings, right, if you want to be ranked in the top 10 and the top five, you really can't have any blemishes on your record in the regular season, right? And if it does, it has to be a really quality one. For me, for Alma, you look at the MIAA, I don't see them having a whole lot of competition and a whole lot of foreseeable roadblocks in that conference. You're looking at teams like Hope gave them maybe a little bit of a run for their money last year. Maybe a team like Albion can bounce back. But for me in that conference, there's not a squad that that stands out and is going to give them really a great competition or a great run at that conference championship this year. And I I think that's the biggest thing for me. And then you look at see what they did scheduling out of conference. They're coming up here to Northern Michigan in a game where, let's be honest, they could very easily walk away with the win in that one against a Division II opponent who's been down in recent history. That also, you know, how that affects playoff things is kind of out of the window. But, you know, that just could build their confidence even more so. So Alma certainly feels like they're going to be right in the conversation and right in the mix that both of you agree with that one. But moving on, I think, to, to the biggest note and what a lot of people like to talk about is who got snubbed, right? And I think people will put out different rankings, but when it comes to these rankings, looking at this top 25 from Lindy's, some teams that go out right away, I'm just going to spout some names and then you guys get right into it, but Delaware Valley, maybe kind of a more controversial one, but I know people were talking about it a lot. Ithaca doesn't make it after a second consecutive Liberty League championship. How about other WIAC potential? Stout, Platteville, names definitely in there. I know Oshkosh lost a lot, but has certainly been in the conversation. Where do we think, what's the first team off the top 25 that, that you think definitely deserves to be on this list? Yeah, I think Ithaca, it sticks out to me. Um, the past three years, they've been... They've been a Northeastern power. I mean, they went to the Elite Eight against North Central two years ago, and then they lost them to Sweet 16. Was it the Sweet 16 last year? And and they're always just a, a, a powerhouse that it, it shocked me when I saw they were in the top 25. I think they're definitely worth the top 25 bid for sure. Yeah. 
hundred percent. Jimmy, I'm gonna uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna go bias aside here, and not, I'm not here gonna go. say stop, but uh, I will say. Platteville finished the year really, really strong. They won the Ithsus Bowl, like, very convincingly. And uh, they're always a very good football program, and I was pretty surprised to see Platteville outside the top 25. 100%. On the topic of Platteville as well, how about the Platteville product that's with you in Cincy, in Blazek? Yeah, Justin Bl- Blazek. I call him Blaze. Uh, we call him Blaze. And it's crazy to, to have another D3 guy going through what I'm going through in the in the, in the the NFL. I mean, we came really close throughout the uh, OTAs and – and he's got that right mentality. He's got the uh, a good head on his shoulders, and he puts in that work. I think uh, the sky's the limit for him for sure. But it's been cool being uh, able to have a teammate who is coming up from the same level I'm at and uh, or I was at and going through the same thing I'm going through. So, yeah, yeah it's man, definitely cool. Lived it. It's ridiculous. He just seems like – again, I haven't seen the dude play in person. I know they gave a, a great game to Michigan Tech last year. He's got to be textbook just physical freak of nature. Now, then again, though – isn't literally everyone on that roster and at that level. So that's kind of, uh, I guess, a, a given. Yeah. I mean, I'm our third round draft pick, uh, McKinley Jackson. He's about 5'10, maybe 330, but he's pull, doing eight pull ups like it's nothing. And I know some of my friends who, <laughs> who can't even do three of them. Like, I'm seeing freaks of nature that should, they have no business doing pull ups, crank them out and just doing all, all, as well as other crazy things in the weight room. But, and the moving the way they do, this is it's the next level. And Justin's one of those guys. Like he is a he's a beast. He's gonna he's gonna make it hard for a, a coach to make a decision when it comes to preseason for sure. Absolutely. And and going back to to look at the rankings, Jimmy, I know uh, you had, had talked about or at least put in our notes here talking about St. John's Central down there, and then Washington and Jefferson ranked in that in that top twenty five. Potentially a name that maybe you weren't expecting to see on this list. Yeah, um, another kind of team where I was like, okay, like. They're they're obviously a good program, but they're not in the strongest conference. And like, yeah. I think these rankings did not really take into account a lot of like the conference these teams play in. Like Mullenberg, another good program, but they're ahead of Alma. Like it's kind of just a head scratcher. Like again, that's not a shot at Mullenberg. That's more of just like a. I just feel like Alma's too low personally. And Way then, uh, yeah, I know Washington Jefferson. Like we said, not in a great conference. Uh, I thought St. John's. Obviously, they didn't finish the year super strong, but they're just a perennial powerhouse in division three. Like they're always good. And they, they opened the year last year at seven and they're 24 this year. So yeah. there's, that's pretty, that's a pretty decent size discrepancy in the differences of last year and this year. So that was kind of a uh, definitely notable for sure. Yeah. And you talk about, I guess, focus on this top five, right? A little bit. So down the list for those listening goes North central Mount union, Cortland, Wartburg and lacrosse. And you know, I think if you were to blind test me and, and to put like a kind of a top five teams in there, I really do think I would say those names. Honestly, I don't know if they would be in this order, but I, I feel like that top five feels like a really good consensus of where D3 college football kind of runs through right now. How do we feel about that? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like Mount Union hasn't lived up to Mount Union's name in the past five years. Okay. You know what I mean? I mean... Last year they lose in the Sweet 16. The year before, did they they lost in the championship? But I feel like they lost in the Sweet 16 twice in the past like four years. And when you think about Mount Union, you think about all oh, the purple power, like the all the national championships. And yeah, they had those, but not recently. So when I see them at number two a- ahead of the defending national champions, it kind of makes me scratch my head because yeah, they're gonna be a powerhouse for sure, but they haven't done it. So I don't know why I'm not sure why they're in front of Corland and especially at number two. It's kind of crazy to me. No, I, I do hear I do hear where you're coming from, and, and I totally get that. And I think, you know, a big part of that to play at least devil's advocate here uh, a little bit um, is that, you know, you have – you talk about that expectations, right? And I actually went – I remember taking an artificial to Mount Union when I was coming through high school, and, and kind of one of their sticking points was, like, you come here, you play four years, you're going to have a ring. And that was, like, that's their selling point because they're there, like you said, so consistently. Um, but that has changed a little bit. And, I, and so – while they certainly are still, like you said, a powerhouse, yeah, they haven't really been able to get the job done in that same capacity, that same fashion. But in that same light, maybe we're holding them to this ridiculous standard of what we think and believe and know that Mount Union is. So there's kind of that weird balance, I guess, for me, and, and I guess just trying to play, you know, like I said, that middleman of, 
of appeasing all. But I, I do get what you're saying, and I think a lot of those picks, when you talk about the North Central and Mount Union in those top two spots, it's a lot of history-based stuff, right? And for and for right. Lindy's, I'm assuming that's where a lot of that's coming from. How about Little Wartburg and UW Lacrosse, two teams we haven't talked about at least tonight quite as much. Wartburg, I think you go back to that game uh, that was a semifinal, I believe, correct, against North Central, and that game back and forth, that was an incredible one to watch. Uh, Jimmy, we had the chance to see UW Lacrosse play North Central in person and saw the talent they had on display. They they do graduate quite a bit, losing some key pieces um, over there down in Wisconsin. But, uh, Jimmy, how are you feeling about uh, the Eagles at the end of the year? Um, well, obviously, anytime you have a head coach as uh, great as Coach Janice, I mean, you're going to have a chance. I mean, when you have a guy like that leading your team into battle every week, you know, you know you're going to give yourself a chance to win. Uh, I mean, I don't see any reason why lacrosse doesn't have a great year. I mean, they're obviously had a fantastic run last year, ran into a powerhouse in North Central. Um, I, another thing I'd like to add earlier, we were talking about like offenses that like stood out like last year, this year, whatever. I mean, lacrosse is definitely like a top three caliber offense in, in okay. division three last year, in my opinion, you know, you had guys like Kaiser Halterbrand, Jack Studer, like, you know, some real dogs out there. So explosive. And it's going to be much in the same in that, uh, you know, them and whitewater is kind of the race for the top of the WAC, or are we going to see, um, another one of these, maybe like that second tier of WAC team, maybe, kind of take that next step this year and, and be more in the hunt. Not that they haven't been in the past, obviously, but you know what I mean. It's been a two-horse race uh, these last couple of years. Is that going to stay the, stay the same or change up a little bit in uh, 24? I think it's going to change up a little bit. I think there might be a few dark horses that people aren't really seeing coming in the WAC, and I think it's going to be uh, it'll be an interesting year for sure. Yeah, I know you've been very high on River Falls, and, and rightfully so. We're talking about returning a lot and returning your guy under center in Blaha. So um, that's a squad and an offense, I think, more particularly, we probably should keep our eye on. Mm -hmm. definitely absolutely like that yeah absolutely and then Warburg I guess more particularly when it comes to them I mean I admittedly haven't followed them a, a ridiculous amount we did the story on the uh the offensive lineman that was also uh an all-conference golfer over there for the Knights that was an awesome one but uh other than that we haven't talked too much about Warburg this offseason you look at I believe it was Owen Grover right that incredible linebacker they had they had a whole linebacker core and a defense that was playing outstanding ball throughout the course of the playoffs they graduate quite a few of them so it'll be interesting to see what they do and that's the uh the American Rivers Conference, if I'm if I'm correct in saying that, uh, I'm not sure what conference they're in. To be honest, I was going <laughs> to yeah, ask. I was going to ask you. Boys. I was going to ask you about War Warburg because as a player, I always saw them uh, recently, the past two three years, like in the top top five, top three, whatever. But I never really heard much about them. I knew they had the nice running back. I think Turbo they called him and a really good defense. But other than that, like, I never really heard much about Warburg at all, but I just saw they kept winning and winning. Haven't been able to get past the Final Four, but, but yeah, yeah what, what, who are they bringing back? What, what's their – how are they going to be winning games this year, basically? That's a that's a really good question, and, and to be honest with you, one I'd have to do more research on. It feels like, for me, obviously being – we're still in the grand scheme of things pretty new to covering the whole small college scene, and we're not, like, totally tapped in with everything. I need to do my homework on Warburg because it feels like their MO over there is, like, they're not a – you know, a flashy team and one that has this big, uh, you know, social media presence and other things of putting out, and it's not a knock on them at all. It just feels like kind of the way they, they go about their business over there. They show up and they win a lot of games. It is the American Rivers Conference, so I did at least get that one correct um, in saying that. Uh, looking at their conference, though, and kind of their competition throughout the course of the regular season, if my computer would like to to load this up. But in short, I mean, to answer your question, I have to do my homework. I really do on Warburg. Right. I don't think I know nearly enough about uh, about that squad and what they're returning in 20, 2024. But uh, anyways, talking about the uh, the ARC and that conference, it looks like Warburg, obviously, on top of that one. But you look at teams like Augustana. Is a squad in there that uh, has certainly made a lot of noise. Co College has has their had their game. Saint o Saint Olaf, excuse me. Um, going down the list though, Gustavus, Jimmy, a team that that you've seen, um, and Central. Central would be the other notable one in that in that conversation in that conference, and the other one that is in this uh, top twenty five. They're slotted in at seventeen. So, yeah, uh, long way of saying I have no idea. Cool. <laughs> right from from what I understand is they're just they. They play physical football. They stuff the run and, the, and they run the ball. So that's what I know about them. I haven't played them. I watched their one game against North Central in the Final Four, but that's really all I know about them. To be honest, is that they run the ball and they stop the run. They got a great defense. Yeah, 
Hey, shout out the Knights. That's on me. I'm going to do my homework. I'm going to get right with you. But, um, fellas, before we before we close it off, any other squads here that uh, at least their positioning or other pieces kind of pique your interest or other uh, sorts of that nature? No, I, th- I think the biggest thing for me is just seeing Portland at number three. You know, they have yeah. the house. They're at the top. They, they should have the number one spot until they get beaten. You know what I mean? Fair enough. I'm with Fair you, enough. Cole. Like, for sure. Like, you know, I, obviously, I don't make any rankings or anything, but I also would have put Cortland at one. Like, you guys beat North Central. You should be number one. Like, does that mean North Central can't go win the national championship th- this year? No. But, but the team that won it last year should be one. You know, I, 100%. So. No uh, right. no conversation on Mary Harden Baylor just sliding right back into 10 after the season. Yeah, that was a little – that, that caught my eye too. They, okay. Did they lose four games last year? Yeah, three? now, again, was it? granted, they might have had the toughest out-of-conference schedule yep. in all of Division three football, so I'm going to at least yeah. give them a little bit of slack there. But you talk about a team like Mount Union that was not the same as what we're used to and the Purple Powers, right, going right back to that conversation. Mary Harden Baylor was very much – uh, not in that category. Harden Sim is taking advantage of that being the benefactor and uh, winning the conference down there. And the, and uh, it, it, at least in these rankings, that certainly doesn't seem to matter. They slide right back in at number 10, and, and we'll see how they handle that. Yeah, we will see how they handle it. I, I forgot they were in the top 10, to be honest, especially after the year they had. So, I mean, they've been a powerhouse, like you said, Purple Powers. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll see. It's, it's too early to tell. They're definitely not a top 10 team in my eyes yet. I mean, they should have been top 25. But, uh, yeah, these rankings, I mean, there's they're so so baseline right now. It's hard to tell. Yeah. I yeah, that. one of my notes here was, like, we'll see what these rankings look like at the end of the year. I say, you know? right. it ain't about where you start, about where you end up. These rankings exactly. are uh, just a piece of it. And, if anything, just a conversation point for us. But uh, unless you guys have anything else, I think that's all for us tonight, fellas. I appreciate y'all joining me, man. Yeah, let me just let me just say one thing for all the all the guys who are looking at the rankings, getting ready for their season. Uh, coming from a guy who was just doing it last year, seeing our rankings and not being happy and always questioning, like, are we really not? where we think we should be. Like, I looked at the top 10 like it was an impenetrable wall. Like, you have mm-hmm. to be this powerhouse to be in there. But really, the, the rankings don't mean anything. You get into the playoffs, and it's one game. Who's going to come there? Who's going to play their best that game? So the number one goal as a, as a uh, Division three football player is to get into the playoffs because anything can happen at that point, and rankings are out the window. Well said. Well said, my man. Yeah, tell that to uh, – we'll go back to the Grove City kicker. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Literally, that, you're you're just that, that makes me think about like how because we were close to losing in the round one and round two. So oh, yeah, how many te- how many teams have been amazing teams but just got a little unlucky? Because you know what I mean. One thing I realized was that it takes a lot, a little bit of luck to get into a to win a national championship. You're playing five rounds of playoffs. It takes a yes. small amount of luck, a lot of skill, but a small amount of luck's got to play in, into it too. Like we were about a foot away from him making that field goal and never seeing what we did. So. 100%. Makes me wonder how many teams have gone it. through that. You absolutely need it, and uh, yeah, we will. Uh, we'll find out who has it this fall, gents. But uh, glad to have you boys on here. Have a good rest of your night. I hey, appreciate Take it, care. man. See you guys later. Yeah. Joining the show tonight, a man who has been a part of every game for Concordia University Ann Arbor since they started playing ball in 2011. The co-defensive coordinator for the Cardinals, Coach Mestres. What's up, Coach? What's up? How you doing? Happy to be on. Hey, happy to have you back on. By the way, it has been. 137 episodes, I believe, from 29 to 166. We're graced with your likeliness over video this time around. It's not just a phone call in. We've we've upgraded at least a little bit in that time span. But March 3rd, 2021. I did the I went back and found the date. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That feels way longer than what the time span actually is. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. But that's what's what's so special is the fact that. Um, you know, 10 years later, I mean, three years later, we can uh, come back and uh, and have a, another conversation, albeit maybe forced by some not great news. And I guess catapulting yeah. right off of that, we'll jump into it, man. You guys uh, released the news just last week about uh, this season, 2024, is it for the Cardinals. Uh, they announced last week the athletic programs are going to be cut after this year. The school will remain open. But just talk to me right away about the immediate reactions from you guys, the staff, the players, and, and that whole unit over there. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's definitely you have kind of when we first find out, found out, like you got a wide range of emotions. Like you have just frustration, anger, confusion, um, the uncertainty of what the future holds. And uh, 
but you know, for us, like to be able, like, we just got out in front of it as much as we could. Like we were transparent and honest with our team. Like we met with them um, hours after we found out to kind of tell them um, coach Shu just was amazing on the zoom, just kind of laying it out and just telling them the facts of our situation. Like, this is our, our last year at Concordia football. Um, and then we just kind of followed it up calling um, every kid kind of seeing where their head was at and kind of explaining, you know, uh, some questions that they had about different things, but it's uh, it's definitely been special talking to the guys and to have over a hundred guys locked in to play, I think is incredible and just a testament to how special of a group of kids that uh, we've recruited and we have here. Yeah. And I think, you know, with the breaking of that news too, I mean, I, I was going to say it's not optimal time when is right. I don't think there is yeah. such thing with an announcement of that sort, but like you said, now you've got a group of guys that are potentially more fueled than ever before about going into August. And before we got going, you had just talked about, man, let's just get to August because I'm sure right now, you know, not to say you're just sitting around all day, you have all this free time, but obviously compared to August, it probably feels like that right now. There's all these question marks and all these things from the outside world. I'm sure that you and the guys are looking forward to, Hey, let's get to fall camp, get our hands on some football, some playbooks, some X's and O's and just play football. Uh, Cause that part of it, unlike everything else is not going to change for you guys, at least this fall. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a hungry, hungry group. Like we have over 30 seniors with COVID guys. We're an older veteran team. A lot of guys have poured in a lot of hours, um, you know, to this season. And, and to me, I think, you know, speaking honestly, I think it, NAI, you know, D3 um, level of football. I think that there's always kind of a crew of guys that get into fall camp and they're like, ah, this really isn't for me Absolutely. and those things. And guys leave where to me, man, if you're rolling with us through this, like you're, you're in it, you're a dirty bird <laughs> yes. ready to go. So uh, to me, I think having everybody all on that kind of same mindset and uh, kind of already been through a lot of tension to me, like I really, I'm really looking forward to seeing that pay off you know, when we're playing games this fall. Yeah, and and absolutely not to make light of the situation, but on a, on a real note here, is this potentially the easiest offseason and in-season when it comes to recruiting for you guys and the staff over there? Yeah, it's uh, – I, I definitely – it's just different to yeah. me, honestly. Like, we uh, – um, you know, I really look at it with our freshmen. It's like a lot of them signed, you know, December, January – we got our first email about kind of some uncertainty with our school in February. Okay. And, you know, then it was like, yep, we're good to go. We got that news kind of, you know, during spring ball a little bit before. So it was like you were kind of re-recruiting those guys again. And then, you know, this news came in, you know, June, obviously. So you've just kind of been constantly talking to those younger guys. And for us, you know, there's definitely still guys that are uh, – we still have guys reaching out that are interested in joining us. Um, even if it's just for a year, because I think if some guys don't have a home in June, you know, it can be a special thing to uh, to join us for a year and, and see what happens. I mean, yeah, you look at those transfer portal numbers, right, as far as the NCAA is concerned, and you've got over 5,000 names still in that, at least, uh, you know, that was about a month ago, so hopefully that number has gone down. But uh, safe to say there's there's more than enough guys to field a couple ball squads uh, still hanging around out there, and a few of them, I would imagine, are pretty talented. But uh, on a very real note, you guys you have got a passionate group over there in terms of your coaching staff, and now it becomes – this idea and this looming factor of having to relocate, having to find another job. Now, going through this, you know, they know they're going to be in the job hunt whenever that final whistle blows, whether for you guys it's in, you know, early November or December, whenever that happens, whenever this season comes to an end. How do you not let that affect the mindset? Because I know right now I'm sure the a lot of the rhetoric is about, hey, let's just enjoy the time that we have right now with this current set of guys, this squad. Yeah, I think what's really helped us kind of keep – uh you know, for like the main thing, the main thing is kind of just like how we talked about our seniors, like our coaches, like we're not a coaching staff that's, you know, been together for a year. Like I've been at Concordia since I was 18, our head coach, you know, like he's been there. This is going to be his 12th or 13th season. Yeah. Like we love this place. And, you know, when we're doing summer workouts and I'm looking in and working out a fifth year senior, like, yeah, the main thing is the main thing. Like, I'm going to give you everything that I have to make this year of football incredible. So, to me, like, it's, I think, uh, what's been cool um, for our staff is, you know, we're kind of relatively all around the same age, and we've all been through, you know, different things. Obviously, you know, my son um, with kind of his health concerns, and it's like, I you're going to go through uncertain times as a man. And for me, I think having 
some great older coaches that are much wiser than I am, like our head coach and Chance Childers. Um, just kind of having them as like older guys to really kind of keep this team locked in on that and have one message has been so special. And uh, to just kind of have like, you know, you can't rely just on you. Like you have to have, like you have to have a relationship with Jesus and use that faith to kind of help you through these uncertain times because you're going to have bigger doubts in your life than, uh, you know, what's happening in six months playing college football. Absolutely. So that's been special uh, to kind of tie in with the guys on what they'll learn this year. A hundred percent. And you and to grow those connections, those relationships even stronger if, you know, if those don't didn't already exist, but um, it does feel like the, the people in this equation potentially uh, getting the shortest stick possible are those incoming freshmen, the guys that you talk about coming into the fall that, um, you know, hope that like most graduating seniors, they'll be signing on for four or five years or whatever that looks like. And now, they're going to have to go and turn around and make that change. Uh, it kind of goes right into my next question of being like, we talked about the coaches potentially having to be on or not potentially going to have to be on the job hunt here. And uh, you know, half a year or whatever it is, this turns almost into a contract year for the players. If, if we're talking NFL terms, they got to they go out there and, and, and earn their money, so to speak next year. That's just an interesting idea in the world of, of college athletics. And I think a lot of people say they play every year. Like it's a, like it's a contract year. That's, BS, um, at least from my perspective, but in, I guess in all intents and purposes, that's what this is for your guys. It's kind of interesting to see it in that perspective. Yeah, no, it's been real interesting to have those conversations because each grade level is almost a little bit different with the questions that they ask. And okay. for a lot of the freshmen, I think, um, especially them, like we have very, you know, tight knit forge relationships with how much they've been through with us. And, uh, you know, my plan definitely you know, I want to keep coaching college football. That's my plan. And uh, I'm like, I want to coach you for four years, no matter where I'm at. Yeah, and so that's absolutely. kind of been that's, one that's of the point. things we've talked about. So um, to us, and then it's also making a commitment to the guys, like, you know, we're honest and we tell you everything about Concordia when we've, when we recruited you here, where it's like, we are going to work to find the best home possible for you. Like that is our job after this is over is uh, making sure that, that you have, every opportunity that you want. Heck yeah. Going to be a lot of, uh, wherever, you know, whatever that, that staff branches out and ends up, uh, kind of finding their, finding their homes here in the next, uh, year or so. A lot of the, more of that recruiting back, uh, if you will, and, and trying to keep those guys, depending on what level, uh, those respective, uh, people end up at, but talk about the void that this program is going to leave in a, in a very saturated football state that has is Michigan between all levels, this is the top performing NAI team in the state and one in a conference that we'll talk about in a little bit that is just loaded top to bottom with talent. What does uh what is Michigan and, and the NAI going to miss, I guess, with this squad in in short? Yeah, it's definitely gonna be different. Uh like it's hard for me to even comprehend what uh what it's gonna look like without us there. Cause you talk about, you know, our location is so different, I feel like, than a lot of schools, you know, being so close to Michigan and downtown Ann Arbor. Um, that it's definitely different. It's just another, you know, it's been a great opportunity to really help. You know, there's a ton of Michigan high school football players that get opportunities to go play football. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's they're losing another school that's able to do that. So to me it's definitely it's it's so tough for me to even uh kind of envision that and wrap my head around that that it'll be uh It'll definitely be a changeup, but there's uh yeah, our conference will definitely look different when uh when we're out of it. Yeah, man. That's that's to say in the least, right? Obviously. And um, you know, looking at this hopefully maybe in a little bit of a potential spin or a potential light, if you will, having this I think you mentioned it before we got going, and that most schools in this situation, Birmingham Southern for a great example in recent memory, they don't find out until it is literally too late in the fact that, you know, this thing's closing, it could happen in a week or a month, right? You guys getting this advance is, is certainly peculiar in that regard. Does that process benefit the families of those on the coaching staff potentially at all who are now going to be uh, prepared at least a little bit more for a change of scenery in six to eight months, something along those lines? Because you talk about the family aspect and what is uh, in this coaching world for these uh, coaches having to usually relocate their entire families and significant others that have positions of their own. Does that knowing that in this far in advance, does that at least ease that process a bit? Yeah, it's, that's, yeah, it's tough. I feel like, uh, I feel like kind of what you said earlier, like there's no, uh, there's no perfect time for it, but um, yeah, definitely for us, like we kind of can think through those things for a minute now in June, but uh, 
I feel like for us, like we really, we really kind of believe in, in the team that we have. And for us, I think like the best chance for us to kind of stick together and to all be able to, you know, keep coaching college football is to go out and have a great year this year. So for me, I think it's some of, uh, you know, I've definitely like talked to my wife about, you know, logistically, you know, like what are states, what are options, things like that. Yeah. Um, but outside of that, I've just been, uh, I really believe in this football team. And I think that uh, the Lord's always taken care of and provided for me. And uh, so I, I got confidence that uh, that I'll wind up where I'm supposed to. Hell yeah. No better time to, to buy in than the present, man. But let's talk about this year. Let's talk about this team. The schedule for this year is one that, uh, like I mentioned earlier, man, it's it's a tough schedule, but I guess in short, nothing that you guys aren't used to. On your side of the conference, the obvious tall tasks, Indiana Wesleyan, Taylor, those kind of squads. But, then, man, the Midwest side of the MS, uh, MF. S.A., that's a tough one off the off the tongue there, but squads <laughs> like St. Francis, St. Xavier, those kind of teams, again, a really tough schedule, but it's a tough conference, nothing that you guys aren't used to. Is that kind of the general consensus? Yeah, like it's year in, year out. The MSFA is, I think, the best conference in the country, and there's a lot of good coaches on every team and a lot of really talented players, and we've gotten, you know, there's definitely recruiting battles that have happened, so I feel like teams kind of naturally know each other really, really well. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, it's going to be a tough schedule. I'm definitely like, I'm really excited, you know, for our home opener. Um, cause I feel like it's, you're excited for every opening game of every, yeah. of every season, but I definitely think our place will be rocking because, you know, you got X amount of home games guaranteed to you. And, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of people that come out to our games. Like I, our games are packed to begin with. But I think there's going to be even more people there because um, they know it's like, yeah, this is the last home opener ever. Um, so I'm really excited to see kind of the the support that our players feel um, when we play at home. Um, but, yeah, no, we have – I'm really excited for our schedule. We got three night games, which will be a blast for the guys, um, and then ending it with our, you know, mid-east side of the conference. So it'll be, it'll be great football all year long. Hell, yeah, man. The uh, Dirty Birds end game on the graphic, by the way, that's just – yeah, awesome. we had we had an alumni Hunter Maynard that died. he is he's a wizard at doing that <laughs> graphic. So that's awesome. Had, yeah, I was I was just talking with him about it. I was like, you know, because I was like, hey, we don't want to talk about last dance because it's like that's not our own thing. But I'm like, yeah. end game us. So uh, yeah, no, I think that's gonna be gonna be sweet for the guys and some of the things we do with the team with that, uh, which I think will be pretty fun. That is awesome, man, and, and you know, being able to not make light in it, but just uh, to embrace it, right? In, in that oh, capacity, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, it is. You're right. That's exactly it is. It absolutely is. So um, we're pulling for you over here, man. Not that we haven't been in the past, but uh, really excited to, to see what you guys go and do. Um, you know, they say the most the dangerous person. Someone's got nothing to lose. And, and you guys are, are all eggs and you know, all eggs in one basket right now. Everybody's uh, rowing in the same direction over there at, uh, at Concordia. So excited to see not only that opener, but then what you continue to do throughout the season. This is a team that has been no stranger to uh, some potential postseason success. So uh, see what kind of uh, Cinderella story you guys cook up down there in Ann Arbor. Yeah, we're, we're working for it. So we're, we're excited. Uh, we're excited to get the ball rolling. Absolutely. Coach. Thank you so much for your time, man. So glad you can come back on here, connect, and uh, wish you the best. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Two great guest conversations down. Got some preseason rankings in. And uh, now for two, I just think, incredible storylines. We'll start the first of which. How about the youngest offensive coordinator in college football? That is just a ridiculous statement. It's a ridiculous sentence. And... Uh, it's the man right here, Kenny Hirschner. He played quarterback at UTPB. A, uh, for those of you not familiar with D2 Ball, it's the University of Texas at Permian Basin, if I am not mistaken. He's the man holding the trophy right there. Coach uh, Chris McCullough we had on the program not too long ago. Talked with them. He led them to the Lone Star Conference Championship in 2023 after uh, transferring. He left uh, East Central University as a grad transfer. And uh, in 2023... These were, these were the stats for uh, who, who now going by Coach Kenny over there for, uh, I believe, the Falcons. 2,900 yards and 30 touchdowns passing. How about 700 more and eight touchdowns on the ground rushing? He was the Conference Offensive Player of the Year, first team all LSC. He was the All-Texas Non-FBS Offensive Player of the Year Award. <gasps> All-region team and also nominated for the Harlan Hill. This dude did it all for the Falcons last year, and uh, I think that picture just kind of encapsulates a good part of that because uh, they got some hardware to show for it. Ended up falling in the playoffs. But uh, 
you know, a great story and, and what seems like a great dude. Gonna have to get him on the program and talk a little bit to him about uh, the situation over there. Like I said, though, he's the co-offensive coordinator. For those of you familiar, he'll be the passing coordinator. He'll also coach the quarterbacks down there for UTPB. He's 23 years old. I am 22. I turned 23 in like three weeks. And uh, slight birthday plug, but the fa- I just <laughs> I say that because like the fact of like I who also just got like my first like real job and like being at that same stage of life and being a co-offensive coordinator for a not just a random college football team but a damn good Division two college football team that is impressive want to give him his flowers because that is seriously an impressive feat and everything that I have heard seen read about this guy and this job and just kind of this process right now I think it all boils down to the fact that like he's ready uh, from the people over there, they've endorsed him. Obviously, the guys he played with, the guys on the current coaching staff right now, Coach McCullough and, and everyone over there, they all seem to express that same sentiment of, of just, this dude is ready. He's ready for the responsibility, ready for the task and everything that comes with this. He also, I believe, just got engaged. Like, things are just happening right now in this guy's life. I could not be more happy for him uh, over here from D1R. Happy for you, Kenny. Uh, hopefully, we can get you on the show here soon. But he's also one of three former players joining the staff for UTPB, which I think is also worth noting. That is awesome. So, Matt Zubiet, Kenny, of course, and then Hayden Kelly have all turned in their shoulder pads for whistles. That is pretty cool, the fact that uh, they can all do that. Now, not all of them are going to be at the... uh, coordinator level uh you know i believe the other two are on like a kind of a grad assistant type basis as i as at least as far as what i've read um they'll kick off their their home season against western new mexico august 31st but uh it kind of looks like yeah the other two I, I i couldn't find at least anything but um it looks like there's kind of be like a grad assistant which again there's nothing wrong with that like that is how everything is you like supposed to go. You're not supposed to graduate and then be the quarterbacks coach and potentially the passing game coordinator. That doesn't make any sense. That is so crazy. That's so crazy. Um, it's they talked about it here. They said to go straight from playing to coaching. It's honestly an honor and an opportunity that not everyone has. A big role to be in charge of a position group. So Zubiet is in charge of a position group. So there you go. Um, and Hayden Kelly is a guy that I think we've talked about quite a bit. It was kind of a snub on a lot of uh, postseason accolades lists and other other things. But uh, it's just an exciting time to be a fan of this program. Permian Basin is, is certainly on you know the right trajectory right now. And a lot of it is due to the head coach over there, Chris McCullough, and what he's done. But also due to these guys, the guys he's brought in, um, the guys that have made this program something worth talking about right this is news but it's not news because it's a crazy hire and it's not news because it's ridiculous it's news because this dude earned the job and he just happens to be 23 years old like that's the reason it's news it's all for the right reason so excited for UTPB excited for the Falcons that's a, that's a great story over there now let's close out the episode on potentially an even crazier story uh this one is about the former NAIA player of the year just this last year going to perform at a Big Ten camp and that's just something that, like, I, it caught me off guard 100%. I did not expect this at all. Jalen Gramstad, he's the quarterback from Northwestern, a team that, once again, we've talked about a lot on this show. I wonder why. Because they win football games. They win a lot of them. He worked out at Nebraska, of all places, over there in the Big Ten at the Big Red, maybe trying to keep the same color scheme as you see here, trying to keep that color going. He might uh, like the way he looks in it. But uh, he worked out at Nebraska, and it just, for me, is – as someone who, you know, sees a lot of guys make that jump, it was just a very interesting story. Not one that I expected, I think, at all. And so that was, the, again, why it kind of caught me off guard. Um, but it, they received uh, a pleasant surprise over there in Nebraska when he walked in and started competing at camp. Like I said, it was the NAI Football Player of the Year, and uh, it was a postgraduate football camp at their indoor center. He's six foot, 190 pounds. And so that's kind of the first, I think, if you're – Looking at that and how he scales to a Division One level, especially a Power Four level, six foot one ninety at the quarterback position is not typically going to cut it for a lot of squads. But I will say, anyone who's watched this dude play on the football field knows that he has every intangible, and he's also just a very gifted athlete and gifted football player. So has that going for him. The size certainly is not there. So they won a national championship, not this year, but last twenty twenty two. They made it to the national championship in 2023, lost to Kaiser in a, in a pretty uh, pretty awesome game. And uh, in 2022, it looks like uh, 
247 yards, three tuds in the natty, ran for 156 and scored. That's ridiculous. There's your stat right there uh, for anyone doubting. That's that's so crazy. Uh, His first full season as a starter, it was an NAIA best 3,681 yards and 35 touchdowns. That's combined. Uh, That's, uh, by the way, on 68% passes through just nine interceptions. That's pretty good. Uh, that was, uh, by the way, that's my bad. That is just passing. The th- 3,600 or 3,700 is just passing. Also ran for 772. Like, this is, it's ridiculous. He's amassed, let's see the math here, over 8,000 yards total and 90 touchdowns in his career at Northwestern College. <sighs> what makes the story even crazier, too, is that at the Nebraska camp, there was a conference rival, Midland University, is also in, I believe that's the G Pack, if I'm not mistaken. They had multiple coaches working the camp. And imagine, right, you know, to make an example of like GV and Ferris, say Grand Valley is at a Michigan State camp and a Ferris quarterback, you know, uh, why am I going to, I'm going to blank on the name now of all times. Carson Golker shows up to the, to the camp. And uh, Wooster's sitting there like, holy shit, what are you, what are you doing here? You're <laughs> like, what? Could you imagine being a rival coach at a camp where you have no anticipation of seeing anyone that you played against the last year? In walks probably the dude that gave your defense fits for the last three to four years. And <laughs> you're just sitting there like, what? Oh, that just makes the story uh, even more interesting. Um, freshman quarterback Dylan Rayola was also present during that workout. So I guess it wasn't strictly a postgraduate workout. And that the question marks have been all over you know, their quarterback room, I think, in Nebraska, and I'm not really someone who follows big-time football that much, but I know that that get getting Dylan there, that quarterback is a five-star, I believe, he is slated to be the next big thing for Big Red up there. Um, it says here that he slipped while running his 40-yard dash, so didn't appear to have the best time, but uh, arm talent apparently looked really good. He's got one season of eligibility, also has a red shirt year, so he can play up to, say he commits to Nebraska, right in this hypothetical that we're living in right now, you and I. He commits to Nebraska. He could play in four years, still get the red shirt, and then come back. Don't know if that's what he wants to do, but there's a possibility for him. So a lot of things that uh, could go on here. And uh, he said, it said here that he was seen walking into the weight room area with the Husker coaching staff after the camp. So you'd imagine that there's pretty good interest on their end. And why shouldn't there be, right? This is a dude that has accomplished... Almost everything you can accomplish, I think it's safe to say, at the NAI level. So I don't think it's a stretch at all to to say that you know I'm not gonna, they're not going to offer him a scholarship on, on the on site. But it's not a stretch to say that that these guys are going to have a great level of interest in uh, in Gramstad. I'll pull up a uh, a few of the highlights here for the the former player of the year because I think you guys just have to kind of see to appreciate the stuff that this guy does in between the white lines on a football field. Um, he does a lot. He does a lot for this squad, and I'll show you here just a few of them. But for me, this is just interesting from a lot of perspectives, not something that um, you see too often. He is also a guy that started his career in 2020, so that COVID year being factored into things, we've seen a lot of this of people, which that's no game against Morningside, by the way. That's so ridiculously awesome. But um, short sleeves also. But um, it's not something that's super, super extraordinary because – a lot of those guys who came in 2020 to get that extra year, he's a guy who's finished his degree at Northwestern. And again, it's all about when you graduate and get that degree, that's when you see a lot of these guys go and seek other potential opportunities, usually trying to make that jump and see because he's obviously dominated at this NAI level. Can I go, can I go do that, excuse me, and do it at the next level? Do it at a Power 4 conference like the Big Ten? That, I think, is the question mark for him. If he decides to do that, awesome. If he doesn't, awesome. If he goes somewhere else, maybe a lower-level D1, or even to a big-time Division II or NAIA squad, I, I wouldn't be surprised. He could. I would assume he's going to try and make the jump up to a D2 or D1 level, but you never know. So that's kind of the scoop on that. Really exciting stuff there, and, and I'm anxious to see where that ends up. But all I got for tonight's episode, thank you all for sticking with me. For D1 Rejects, I've been Kobe Manzo.